Signs are all around us. The rapid rate of change in our environments can be felt by our communities. Sea levels are expected to rise as much as a foot by 2050. Nonprofit Climate Central pictures the future of what cities could look like over time. These rising tides affect our homes, businesses, and have a devastating impact on our ecosystems. New Yorkers are standing up in ways you may not know, restoring what was once a thriving shoreline. The gusting wind keeps increasing in force and frequency, and the rain's coming down so hard it feels like BBs on your skin. Because of the flood waters, and what we are seeing is just total destruction. The real test now, how to rebuild. The general public thinks that New York Harbor is like pretty nasty and nothing is alive in there. But you spend a day out on the water like looking through stuff and you really get an idea of how much life there is and the potential that can come back. New York City was once the oyster capital of the world. On the menu, I'll pack oysters. At one point, containing half of the Earth's oyster population, Overfishing and pollution decimated the population. But one organization aims to reverse the trend. We are monitoring some gabions today. Boosting biodiversity one oyster at a time. I'm setting up my gear, making sure that my oxygen tank is open. So I like if I press this button, the air comes from the oxygen tank. So how many dives have you been on? I've done 16 dives this year with the Oyster Project. Um, in total, 67, 68 dives. The Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit restoration organization that is restoring oysters through education initiatives. Oysters are a keystone species because they're ecosystem engineers. Similar to how coral makes reefs in the south, we have oysters that make reefs up in the north here, which provide habitat for prey and then like places to hunt for predators. So bringing oysters back into the harbor provides that structure which lets other marine life come back in. Besides creating reefs for habitat restoration, an adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day preventing harmful algal blooms and low oxygen levels called hypoxia. Hypoxia typically occurs as the water warms up, there's less available dissolved oxygen for the animals to use. Our waste that runs into the harbor causes those algal blooms. And one of the things that oysters are really good at is sequestering that excess nitrogen and phosphorus and turning it into kind of a usable source for other things aside from microalgae. The group drops gabions full of spat on shell. Think baby oysters growing on the surface. I help monitor uh, like the oyster growth in different sites because it has spat, which are like these um, baby oysters basically. On average, how many of those are on the shelves? Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's like 19. I think. Oh, wow. uh, it's usually like, I'd say around six-ish. Over 75 million live oysters have been restored throughout 16 reef sites across the boroughs. These dropped oyster cages help promote a natural barrier in preventing coastal storm damage. The reason that we dropped the cages the way we did, it's gonna be there for wave attenuation, so it will kind of help absorb that wave energy. You get rid of those reefs, you see crazy storms and just crazy amount of wave energy hitting the shore that really shouldn't be. And that's why things like Superstorm Sandy happen. Oysters, crabs, and coral rely on certain chemical compounds naturally found in water. When you take those out, it leads to corroding marine life. Carbon dioxide emissions are increasing, which strip away those usable compounds. It also increases the acidity of our oceans. One researcher found a way to reverse ocean acidification using a key native resource. We know that all photosynthetic organisms, including plants, take up CO2. High rates of photosynthesis by different organisms in the ocean could combat ocean acidification. Kelp is a winter seaweed. They grow very, very fast. 
You can locate them where you want them by putting them out on lines. We discovered that they can change ocean chemistry, reverse the process of ocean acidification by taking the CO2 out of the water and into their tissue. Lines of kelp were arranged over a dozen New York oyster farms, which turned out to be a great two-for-one for growers. One of the most surprising outcomes was when we grew oysters within the oyster farm with and without kelp. The oysters grew significantly faster in the kelp than next to the kelp. Farmers can focus on two crops during different seasons, kelp in the winter, oysters in the summer. The seaweed can be physically removed and planted again, a cycle that alleviates climate change. The other thing that it is really great at is what's called bioextraction. So as it's growing, it's pulling carbon dioxide out of the water, it's pulling nitrogen out of the water, and if you harvest it at the end of the season, you're then extracting carbon and nitrogen, and you know, you're essentially fighting climate change to some extent. You may have seen the reports this year. There have been six confirmed shark attacks on Long Island this summer. The U.S. averages about 19 shark attacks per year, with a shark attack fatality every two years. You are more likely to get struck by lightning. So why the increase in shark attacks, and how does climate play a role? The uptick in shark sightings this year is a combination of things. Um, sharks have always been here. They're here because it's a sign of a healthy environment. Conservation works. You know, sharks around the world are on the decline. On the east coast of the United States is one of the few places where it's actually the reverse. There are more sharks in our waters right now. Probably more significant driver is we're seeing more of their food. The Atlantic menhaden, or bunker as they're commonly called, are in greater numbers in Long Island waters bunker, they hug the coast. They're filter feeders, so they're swimming with their mouths open to filter plankton and that from the water. So there's a tremendous food source here for not only sharks, but whales and dolphins and osprey. When it comes to climate with warmer waters, Paparo says we may see a shift in populations. So with climate change, we might see more these subtropical sharks, but our local species might move north. So mako sharks, white sharks, blue sharks, they might not like this warmer water and they'll leave. So it's not that we're seeing more, the makeup will be different. We might see different species, you know, with climate change. It would be safe to say hundreds of thousands of people have been in the water from the middle of May till today along the south shore of Long Island. But if you added up all the times that those people were in the water and then came out and then went back in the water, those are all opportunities that sharks could have uh, interacted with a person. And out of those millions of opportunities, six of them went there. Now sharks aren't the only creatures that you can find. Did you know that the tri-state is home to over 20 endangered and threatened species? In fact, we get an annual visit from a southerner who just loves our beaches. And this migratory bird is a rare find. The New York City Plover Project is taking action, cleaning up our beaches and protecting these feathered friends. Meet the piping plover a small migratory shorebird that feeds on various marine worms and other small invertebrate. Most New Yorkers probably don't know, most people don't know, that fewer than 100 piping plovers come to New York City each year. And they're part of a global population of somewhere between six and 8,000. So that is a very small number, right? And so they are federally listed as a threatened species in New York State and in New Jersey and much of your viewing area. I've got a balloon, I've got a hat. Oh, that's a hat. I've got okay, that a diaper. hand sanitizer. I've got, these are, I believe, are old fishing bags for like the bait that yes. people bring. Yes. How has climate change impacted this species? So with climate change, obviously we're having rising sea levels and we're starting to see, you know, more overwash. So in that early season, when we have storms come through, 
that overwash can actually come up high enough to take the eggs out of the nest, and so we lose that nest. And so we're losing habitat as we're seeing sea level rise. Do you feel that locals really understand what's happening on these beaches? Just the numbers of people that we have visiting here, you know, even if it's 10%, you know, that's still probably thousands of people. And I think it's probably more like 60, 70% that really don't know the natural resources that we have here, you know. So it, it there does need to be a lot more public interaction on the natural resources that we have at our backyard. Last but not least, when you see what can be done when we work together, why not try to save our environment? And this last story is a perfect example of how one group turned the tide for one of Long Island's most polluted areas while making history in the process. Shinnecock Bay was really deteriorating. The brown tides have been going on since about 1985. Sunlight couldn't penetrate through that brown tide. It's too many nutrients, we'd call it pollution, that are going into the bay and nothing to take it up. What really got to me was when we started to see red tides. If you were to eat a shellfish that was caught during a red tide in the Western Bay, you could get something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. It's like it sounds, it can cause paralysis, nerve damage, and it could even be fatal. We're not just talking about unsightly. We're talking about human health issues too. The restoration had two main goals, to eliminate harmful algal blooms and bring back marine life. We came up with this idea that if we could restore the hard clam population, then we could restore the natural filtration capacity of the bay. We had calculated we needed 33 million bivalves. Ellen and a team of researchers monitored the bay for marine life using the traditional method of trawling with a net on top of a new tool called environmental DNA. What did you get today? There are some trawl vessels that fish from deep sea that have been said to hold seven 747s inside the net. Wow. Yeah. So the standard conventional method of fish surveying is trawling. And that's missing the little things and the big things. So what eDNA can do, because it's just looking at DNA in the water, is look at that whole size spectrum. And this is where we put in the cooler, and we go to each one of our spots, and then we have two extras, so we collect about 13 little flasks of eDNA every other trawl. In the last two years, we have seen a three and a half fold increase in the numbers of fish in Shinnecock Bay. We have not seen brown tides in more than four years. No red tides. Earlier this year, the Shinnecock Bay was recognized as a global hope spot by Mission Blue, an organization that protects oceans internationally. And it is the first in New York. The Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program has shown us that we can make a difference. We can turn things around. You've just seen a snapshot of our living shoreline. There's much more to discover. Head to our website and download our NBC4 New York app for all climate coverage. Up next, we look back at the devastating storm that rocked the Tri-State 10 years ago. But how prepared are we for the next superstorm? I'm Linda Gaudino, News 4 New York.